May Angelou take one, camera roll th 73, sound roll 38. In your book, you describe segregation as a, you know, as a young girl in Stamps, Arkansas, you describe segregation being so complete that it's as if whites were aliens. Yes. Can you kind of explore that, describe that? Well, people? yes. <clears throat> when I was growing up, whites were called white folks. I mean, it was one word. They were one people, white folks. And um, people who were not very cultured, uh, who had no pretensions to, to the niceties of the world, called them poor white trash. That was one word also. Uh, we, it seemed to me, uh, we blacks, we Negroes, we colored folks were humans. And white folks were those others. They were other than. And as a child, I was certain that white folks didn't have innards. They were all, what you saw was what you got. I mean, their, their bodies, their heads and their bodies were empty, that you could put your hand on a white folks, and your hand would go right through them. That was my belief. They seemed so different. They walked differently. Did you have no, so you had no, no real dealings and interaction with them no. that made them any more human at all. or human at all. as you were? At all. <clears throat> Every action from white folks was an action of of uh, disrespect, uh, cruelty, uh, scorn. So they couldn't be just. Now, mind you, I read about white people in other places, and I believed them. I was a fond reader of Charles Dickens, and so I, I wept with uh, with the children and, and laughed with the Micawber and Oliver. I mean, I was, I, I in fact read Horatio Alger Jr. And I was that little white boy. I understood him. I understood being lonely and, and uh, deprived and almost, um, forced upon one's own resources, which were negligible, if at all. But I didn't connect those people with white folks. I just didn't. Huh. <coughs> what was, what were, so then what was your community like? Was ah, it very insular? Was very it? insular. Um, the, there were women who worked as maids for white folks. And they would bring l laundry over into the black area. And they would stop at my grandmother's store quite often and put the baskets down. And I wanted so to go through those baskets <laughs> and see what if I was used, you know, what did they, what kind of things did they have? But um, the only, the only venturing into our area by white folks <clears throat> took place when people would come over to pick up uh, uh, cotton pickers. Cotton pickers used to gather in the, in the clearing in front of our store. And the white folks would come over either in trucks or wagons and pick up the cotton pickers. And one could see them then. I could see them. And they talked. They didn't, they didn't have what the West Africans in Senegal, the Serer in Tukuleur, call la langue du, the sweet language. I never heard white folks use sweet language. And I always heard black people use it. So, uh, 
the sweet language was a language dependent entirely upon tone. And even the, the lengthening out of a word. So if you spoke, if I spoke the sweet language to you um, in the South, instead of saying, hi there, how are you? I'd say, hey, how you doing? Well, I never heard white folks use sweet language. And I heard black people use it all the time even though they didn't call it that. You simply did it. So... Um, <clears throat> you, talk, you talk about your store. The store is almost like an institution. What, mm -hmm. what, what was the institution of the store? Well, during, at the turn of the century, my grandmother, with two sons, left and divorced my grandfather. in this little village in Arkansas, White women didn't get divorced at the turn of the century, but my grandmother divorced my grandfather. And she had to raise the two boys. So she made meat pies uh, from either canned sausage, or which she canned, or chicken, or uh, ham, smoked meats. She would make them up in the night, and then at midday, she would appear at the cotton gin, which was on one side of town, and the lumber mill was on the other side, five miles apart. My grandmother would fry the meat pies there in front of the cotton gin, and as the dinner bell rang at 12 o'clock, the men would come down and buy these hot meat pies for five cents. If she didn't sell them all, she would wrap the rest of them, turn the brazier of hot coals out, dig a place in the sand and leave it there, and run five miles to the lumber mill, where she'd sell them tepid for two cents. But the next day, she would be at the lumber mill, and she'd sell them hot, fresh, for five cents. After she built up a substantial clientele. She built herself a stall between the two so the men could run to her. And there began her store. She, <clears throat> she in the end, bought most of the land behind the town, much of the land in the town. She was really a West African market woman. I didn't know that till I lived in West Africa. Um, in the, in the time when you were growing up, um, the store, was it a place, was it just a place where she sold goods, or was it more than that for it was. Oh, it was everything. It was the center of the black town that was not... I'm sorry, could you just start by saying sorry. the store, just the store? Sorry, of course. Sure. How are we doing about that? Okay. The store was the center of the black town, um, the non-religious center the lay center. There was a Willie Williams um, do drop in. There was a, a kind of roadhouse, but a place where all the people could come. Uh, well, that, that place was my grandmother's store, but it, she didn't name it her store. She named it for her son, my uncle who was crippled. My uncle was crippled, the whole right side of his body was paralyzed and had been since he was three. Mama thought he was crippled because he'd fallen off a porch. He was crippled because of some neurological malady. But uh, Mama named the store the W.M. Johnson General Merchandise Store so that my uncle was never at the sufferance of a larger society as a black male in the South and crippled. So that was his store. <clears throat> um, on Saturday, women came there and had their hair curled. Um, there was a big chinaberry tree in the yard, and so women sat there and they had crokinole curls put in. The barber would come and mm, do haircuts around the chinaberry tree. Um, 
the Gandhi dancers, who were the men who, who um, worked on the railroad, would come over to the store and buy their Coca-Cola and cheese and sardines and crackers. And the, and the blues singers would come through the, when they were walking through Arkansas. And their sound, I, I, I learned, I think, to speak in my mind because of the sounds of the South, the sounds around the store and in the church. Uh, from the time I was seven and a half until I was almost 13, I was a mute. But I listened, I just <laughs> took in sound. And the, the guys would sing the, from different places had different sounds. So that from the Brazos in Texas, they would sing. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> we have to change, Rhea. Yeah. Take two. Change camera roll 74, change sound roll 39. During the Depression, the troubadours were as peripatetic as were hobos. However, they didn't uh, catch freights because they carried their instruments. And their instruments sometimes were wash tubs and sticks in them, and cat gut. So they had wash tub bases. They could break them down, but they couldn't jump trains. They couldn't catch freights. Um, they had cigar box guitars, literally. Cigar boxes with a fret made of a piece of wood and cat gut strung. And the fellows from Texas, from the Brazos, black, sounded different from the fellows from Mississippi, from the Delta. So <clears throat> they come around the store on a Saturday and sing. And uh, the Brazos guys sound sounded like this. Baby, I want you to know I just don't want you, man. The guys in, from, the ba bra from the Delta sang like this, babe, please don't go. Way back in that time, babe, please don't go. It was so beautiful, goodness. And I would stand in the doorway, I loved it. And my grandmother would say, sister, come away from that. That's worldly music. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I loved it. Music. And it was worldly music, in the best sense of the word. Now, at that time, uh, sort of on a, on a heavier, on a, on, a, on, a, on a sadder, crueler note, mm -hmm. there was lynching going on at the mm -hmm. time. What was the s kind of psychic effect on the, on, the, on the folks in your community? In the community. When, even before a lynching, when a black man had been accused of something which terribly offended the white community, the news went around the black community like a string of Chinese firecrackers being set off. I don't know how it got around so fast. And then a pall, a, a cloud of gloom and fear would settle over the community. Like a, a heavy blanket being put over a light, like a little candle. And people, you could see it, you could sense it, but you could also see it in the sag of the people's shoulders when they'd come into the store and just shake their heads. And I'm sure it is exactly the same 
universal sense of loss and fear and dread and terror that obtained in Russia when the pogroms uh, were rife in the shtetls, when people knew, uh-oh, here they come, the Cossacks are coming. You describe in your book a night, a very specific night. You remember there was a man, I think he was a white man, a Mr. Stewart or I'm not quite, <coughs> and you're, that somebody had messed with somebody in town, your Uncle Willie got so afraid. Well, whenever, um, hmm, whenever the boys, as they were euphemistically called, uh, the clan would ride into the black area. All black men had to hide. And my brother and I would take potatoes and onions out of the bin. Under The bin was under the candy counter. And we'd take potatoes and onions out of the bin and knock the partition out, which separated them. And my uncle would take his stick, holding on to his stick, and laboriously get down into the bin. And my brother and I would cover him with potatoes and onions. And he would lie there all night until you, we couldn't hear the horse hooves, the horse's hooves, or, or the truck, which would ride over and and uh, by its very presence, be a threat. When you, <coughs> when you went to school, what, how were the schools that you went to different from the white schools, the school that you went to? Or, or, or even before that, when did you first discover that your schools were different from the white schools? Well, um, I thought my school was grand. It was the Lafayette County Training School, so there. It was uh, first grade through the 12th, one building. No, there was the second building, a home economics building. Um, because I went downtown occasionally, and downtown was a, an area with one block of paved road and one block of sidewalks. And I saw the white school, which was like four times larger, and bricks and all that. But I didn't, I don't remember envying that. I mean, that was those, those white folks that had nothing to do with me. Until Mrs. Flowers, who is the woman who started me really to reading. I mean, I had learned to read, but to enjoy it. She, when I stopped speaking, this black lady took me in hand. She knew I liked to read, and she encouraged me to read every book in the black school, in the library, starting with A. And after a few months, she would come and ask me, how far I'd gotten, and I'd gotten to B.R. or something. And <clears throat> I had a tablet, which I kept in the belt of my clothes. And I would write how I liked or didn't like. And I didn't understand that much, but I read every book. Well, she had some connection with the white school. And from time to time, she would bring books. And they were new. Uh, that was so unusual to me, because we used the, the thrown away books, the books with the spines broken, or with, no, with one uh, cover gone. And I learned to repair books, because black kids did that. We would get cardboard, and with some cover the cardboard with uh, cloth, remnants that were around, and glue, make cooked glue with, uh, I mean, not just flour,
but cooked flour and water to make glue, put a little coal oil in it, and put that on the back of the spine of the book, maybe even use wood. By the time the book was finished, it looked lovely, you know? So we learned to do that, and, but I had never seen a new book until Mrs. Flowers brought books from the white school for me to read. The slick pages, I couldn't believe it. And that's when I think my first anger, real anger, uh, at a, a d depressive and oppressive system began. I was angry at the way people treated my mama, my grandmother, who owned the land they lived on. I was angry at that, but that was a personal uh, anger because of their maltreatment of mama. But when I saw these, that the white kids had these fresh books, it was so unfair because I loved books and I deserved them. And just because I was black, I couldn't have them. Yes, we can change camera roll. Okay, take three, change camera roll to 75. We, we actually, between roles, we talked about this a little bit, but what effect, if any, did the economic problems of the Depression have on your community? What was the Depression like? Well, there's a, a bitter and yet wry statement which was made by blacks about the Depression. They said in the South that the Depression had been going on for 10 years before black people even knew about it, even knew it existed. And that was true, particularly in the South, in, in villages, in small hamlets and small towns, because um, the people lived subsistence at a subsistence level, for the most part. Many were sharecroppers. and. Uh, that line in the popular song of a couple of decades ago, it was absolutely true. They owed their lives to the company store. So because they hadn't been able to get education, then they were vulnerable to the greed and, and uh, evil of the farm owners. So at the end of a year, the farmer found himself not even, even, not even, even. He found himself in debt. So the, the Depression had gone on long before the crash of 29 took place. Um, <clears throat> I think that... Um, the, I imagine that the large hordes of, uh, of men walking around the country had some effect on the black community. And this is interesting. One of the ways it affected the black community was that the white hobos would come to the black area to ask for food. Now, partly out of pride, and maybe the other part out of an ability to identify, to empathize with the hobo, Black people always gave food. Now they had beans, maybe, with a little piece of, of smoked meat, or dried meat, cured meat. They had cornbread. 
and black people would give beans and cornbread to black hobos and white. So at the railroad line, the, they would all, they would come to the black area first. When you say, I feel like there's something else in that statement, <coughs> that statement. The Depression was going on 10 years before black people. Oh, that, yes. Mm. There's something else about that, about the, I guess the sense of that things were always poor, so yes. maybe white folks felt the difference. Yes. This is true. I mean, the, because of the general subsistence level in the southern uh, states, non-industrialized areas, black people did not, did not depend upon industry or upon uh, Wall Street for anything. They depended upon the earth. They were farmers and sharecropping farmers for the most part so that they were not really affected in a, in a large way. Maybe subtly, yes, but um, it wasn't until the end of the 30s, the beginning of the 40s, with the advent of World War II, when black people left the South and went into the shipbuilding uh, and ammunition plants that uh, they began to, to, in mass, be able to be a part of the market. Oh, I'm going to take a stab at a really wildly general question. You, okay. tell, me, you tell me if you want to, 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 to go for this one. But is there a way that, you know, we're talking about the young people. Is there a way that, in some way, to give a sense of that that life for black people was very different then than it was now. I mean, we're talking about 50, 60 years ago, before the civil rights movement, before a lot of things have happened. Is there some, again, I, I'm dealing in a, I'm, I'm, I'm groping here with a gross generalization, but I wonder if you have any. There were, there were great differences in the quantity and the quality of life in the black communities 40 years ago. Great differences 50 years ago. Um, the things one could hope to own were minimal compared to today's black community. I mean, even in poor areas. Um, a black community could count on, can today, count on there being certain um, things in the house. There will be a television in the house. There will be uh, probably a VCR, and there will be certain, there will be a stove in the house. There will be a refrigerator in the house. There will even be a bathroom in the house and a toilet in the house. People will actually have clothes. They may not be the newest clothes. They may not be the most expensive clothes, but people will have clothes. Now, so here we are talking about things. When I grew up, and in the South of that time, uh, a house was considered all right if it had a floor and walls and windows. Now, that was all right. The floor would have no rugs. The floor would be washed once a week with lye water so that the wood came up white. And that was always a mark of pride for the housekeeper, that her floors were white, white wood, because they were so clean. Uh, <clears throat> the toilet was outside. The bath was a big tub in which heated water was poured once a week. There were places one washed up during the week but the real bath to sit down in water. And the, one didn't turn on the faucet or the tap. 
there was a well and one drew up the water. There are qualitative differences in things. However, there was in the black community a sense of unity, a sense of pride, a sense of love. There was a, a communal sense of religion and morality. People simply didn't do certain things because it wasn't nice to do certain things. Children were loved and looked after. I don't know anybody who ever abused a child. I mean, children got spanked, children got whipped, children got talked to pretty roughly, set over in corners and so forth. But to abuse a child? And this, this is absolutely new in the black community. Never before until the last two or three decades had we heard of people actually burning children and hurting them. Not that there wasn't sexual abuse. I don't mean that. I cannot say that. But even that was not as rife. Children were so valuable. And everybody took pride in all the children. So any woman or any man was subject to call the child away and say, child, who, who's your mama? Who's your papa? Come here. I don't like the way you. I was grown. I came back from Europe. I was a dancer. I was the first dancer with Porgy and Bess, and, and I was a grand young woman. <clears throat> and I had cut my hair off because my hair was very thick and I couldn't dance and keep my hair in a certain kind of style. I went into San Francisco and a man saw me on the street. He said, are you Clyde Ellen Vivian's daughter? I said, yes, sir. Gave me five dollars. He said, go do something to your hair. <laughs> Find a beauty shop. Now, that sense of uh, interdependence and humor. Let me ask you about one other thing, though. Wait, what about about the okay. Okay. Again? Well, Am I talking that much? Okay. Uh, take four, change camera roll 76, change sound to 40. Um, in Stamps, Arkansas, by the time I was 10 years old, um, I expected my brother to become a lawyer. He was a year and a half older than I. He was brighter than I. I didn't expect that for myself because I didn't talk. Um, there was a fellow, Henry Reed, in my school who was almost as bright as my brother, also a little bit smarter than I. Not much, <laughs> but he was a little bit. Uh, I figured that he was going to be a doctor. Now, <clears throat> although the people in my town did not boast of a number of black doctors and lawyers. But I did know that Fisk existed, the university, Fisk University, and Howard University existed. And uh, Tuskegee and Atlanta and Spelman, Morgan State in Baltimore, and Morris Brown and Morehouse, these were, these were heavenly abodes. I mean, I kind of thought that if a child was good and died, the child would go to heaven and become an angel. And if the angel was a good angel and died, it would probably go to Howard. <laughs> I mean, it, that was possible. And it was something to dream of. And black teachers took such pride in black students. And the community took such pride in smart students that a child who had gotten A's would be marched from one church to another. 
And people were saying, now here's his brother so-and-so's little boy. Here he is, here's little Johnny. Stand up, Johnny. Johnny got all A's this week, or all A's this past year. People who, I mean, he didn't belong to that church. People would stand up, praise the Lord, bless his heart. God bless you, honey. Keep on pressing on. So people took pride in the children, and their pride was a, an encouragement to continue. So we thought, with the larger society saying, you cannot, we thought, yes, we could because somebody had gone before us. Dr. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, Marcus Garvey. Those were names in this little village in Arkansas, which were very familiar. Ida, B., Ida Wells, Barnett. We knew these names. We knew and miss uh, Mary McLeod Bethune. Oh. Please, and that was genius walking around, and grace. So the aspirations, I don't think the aspirations were that much different from today's aspirations. The only thing is that we aspired against incredible odds. Can you tell me about the odds, the, the obstacles that the aspirations had to run up? Well, if a child graduated from Lafayette County Training School, uh, she or he would have a very good uh, underpinning in black American literature. You would know Paul Lawrence Dunbar, James Weldon Johnson, County Cullen, Langston Hughes, Georgia Douglas Johnson, Ann Spencer. You would know the 19th and 20th century writers. Um, one might not know mathematics very, very well or have even been introduced to science, other than the name George Washington Carver. Because the teachers had themselves not been trained in the hard sciences, and they couldn't afford to get teachers, black teachers, from the North, or who really had a training, because they could go to better paying schools, you see? So the students came out of the high school without the underpinning they needed, the foundation. They could go on maybe to uh, a, a church college and get some more training in social services. But to try to get to Columbia University or to Howard, it wasn't that easy. They needed maybe two more years of, a, of a, like a junior college to come up to, just to compete with the people in the other schools. That was always um, uh, an obstacle, because families needed their children to work. And children who felt responsible to their families wouldn't take two more years, you see? Was there any sense of even trying to move into the white society? Was there? No. Not that I knew of. <clears throat> I'm sure there were people way over in Texarkana, way over in the big city, or in Little Rock and Pine Bluff, but not in the small towns. It just didn't happen. Sometimes the teachers themselves had only gotten high school uh, education. Well, you talked about a graduation ceremony in your book that you went to, and you felt Again, there was that sense of anger that somebody was imposing a mm -hmm. limit. Limits. Mm -hmm. That was a, a white man who really um, came to speak and to inform the graduating class that they would, they were going to have a new playing field, basketball field, and a, 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 an addition to the home economics building. So I thought, oh, so this is to say we can become athletes and we can become um, better cooks and more adept washerwomen and men. But to aspire to be scientists and philosophers and mathematicians and doctors, 
seemed to be beyond us because they had, the man also insensitively informed us that the white school had been given 50 new microscopes. Um, so obviously we were being told, don't you aspire beyond these limitations. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Emerald right. seventy seven, sound roll for you. Tell me. The last inch of space was filled, yet people continued to wedge themselves along the walls of the store. Uncle Willie had turned the radio up to its last notch so that youngsters on the porch wouldn't miss a word. Women sat on kitchen chairs, dining room chairs, stools, and upturned wooden boxes. Small children and babies perched on every lap available, and men leaned on the shelves or on each other. The apprehensive mood was shot through with shafts of gaiety as a black sky is streaked with lightning. One man said, I ain't worried about this fight. Joe gonna whip that cracker like it's open season. Another said, he gonna whip him till that white boy call him mama. At last the talking was finished and the string along songs about razor blades were over and the fight began. A quick jab to the head. In the store the crowd grunted. A left to the head and a right and another left. One of the listeners cackled like a hen and was quieted. They're in a clinch. Lewis is trying to fight his way out. Some bitter comedian on the porch said, that white man don't mind hugging that nigger now, I betcha. The referee is moving in to break them up, but Lewis finally pushes the contender away, and it's an uppercut to the chin. The contender's hanging on. Now he's backing away. Lewis catches him with a short left to the jaw. A tide of murmuring assent poured out the doors and into the yard. Another left and another left. Lewis is saving that mighty right. The mutter in the store had grown into a baby roar, and it was pierced by the clang of a bell and the announcers, that's the bell for round three, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> He's got Lewis against the ropes, and now it's a left to the body and a right to the ribs, another right to the body. It looks like it was low. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the referee is signaling, but the contender keeps raining the blows on Lewis. It's another to the body. It looks like Lewis is going down. My race groaned. It was our people falling. It was another lynching, yet another black man hanging on a tree, one more woman ambushed and raped. A black boy whipped and maimed. It was hounds on the trail of a man running through slimy swamps. It was a white woman slapping her maid for being forgetful. The men in the store stood away from the walls and at attention. Women greedily clutched the babes on their laps, while on the porch the shufflings and smiles, the flirtings and pinchings of a few minutes before were gone. This might be the end of the world. If Joe lost, we were back in slavery and beyond help. It would all be true. The accusations that we were little lower than, sorry. <clears throat> it would all be true. The accusation, ah. sorry. Can you start again with my race grown? My brother, this is taking me now. I'm doing the best I can, please. Okay. I, 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 <clears throat> I didn't consider that I, would be doing anything other than a reading. That's another preparation. I'll try. My race groaned. It was our people falling. It was another lynching. Yet another black man hanging on a tree. One more woman ambushed and raped. A black boy whipped and maimed. It was hounds on the trail of a man running through slimy swamps. It was a white woman slapping her maid for being forgetful. The men in the store stood away from the walls and at attention. Women greedily clutched the babes on their laps, while on the porch, the shufflings and smiles, the flirtings and pinchings of a few minutes before were gone. This might be the end of the world. If Joe lost, we were back in slavery and beyond help. It would all be true, the accusations that we were lower types of human beings, 
only a little higher than the apes. True that we were stupid and ugly and lazy and dirty and unlucky and most of all that God himself hated us and ordained us to be hewers of wood, drawers of water, world without end. Amen. We didn't breathe. We didn't hope. We waited. No, I, they wouldn't, yeah. I, that, that doesn't follow either, too. I have to do this. I have to do the next. It doesn't. You can cut it if you like. Yeah? He's off the ropes, ladies and gentlemen. He's moving toward the center of the ring, and now it looks like Joe is mad. He's caught Canera with a left hook to the head. A right to the head. It's a left jab to the body. Another left to the head. There's a left cross. A right to the head. The contender's right eye is bleeding. He can't seem to keep his block up. Lewis is penetrating every block. The referee is moving in, but Lewis sends a left to the body. It's an uppercut to the chin. The contender's dropping. He's on the canvas, ladies and gentlemen. Babies slid to the floor. Women stood up. Men leaned toward the radio. Here's the referee. He's counting. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, is the contender trying to get up again? All the people in the store shouted, no, eight, nine, ten. There were only a few sounds from the audience. They seemed to be holding themselves in against tremendous pressure. The man said, the fight is all over, ladies and gentlemen. Here, let's get the microphone over to the referee. Here he is. He's got the brown bomber's hand. He's holding it up. Here he is. And then that voice, husky, familiar, came to wash over us. It said, the winner and still heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis, champion of the world, a black boy, some black mother's son, some black father's son. He was the strongest man in the world. People drank Coca-Colas like Ambrosia and ate candy bars like Christmas. Some of the men went behind the stores and poured white lightning into their soft drink bottles, and a few of the bigger boys followed them. Those who were not chased away came back blowing their breath in front of themselves like proud smokers. It would take an hour or more before the people would leave the store and head for home. Those who lived too far had made arrangements to stay in town. You see, it wouldn't do for a black man and his family to be caught on a lonely country road in the South when Joe Lewis had just proved that a black man was the strongest person in the world. That's it. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.